I mean, I mean, things things are good. You know, things are good. Trying to get back into the swing of things now. Yeah, it's always for me. It's always a challenge when you take extended time off. It's like, oh, this is kind of nice not having to really mm -hmm. do anything. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, but I'm back in it. In fact, I'm so back in it. Um, I one of my commitments is, and this is. Um, What's, what's the right word? This is this is in opposition to what I, I preach from a billing standpoint. Um, but as, as far as really looking to optimize how I work this year and just optimize myself, I've recommitted to being very deliberate in tracking where my time is spent um, and not as a billing resource and not as because anyone is making me track time. But I want to see where my time is going to see if I have opportunities to optimize and maybe spend it in better places. And I don't know that if anyone would care, but I'm actually thinking about open sourcing the data, sharing the data. It's like, if anyone wants to play around with my time that I've captured, it's all yours. Here you go. So I I'm looking at my, my calendar for the last three days and it's very colorful with blocks of time that I've tracked. So. I mean, how's it feel getting back into that? that habit it feels good to me Perfect. actually yeah um one of the things that i noticed and i spent a lot of time over the break kind of thinking about how i work and one of the things that i i noticed is that if i'm not really really deliberate in designing how i work and and not going to the point of adding so much structure that it becomes mechanical but enough structure to keep it from being um reactionary and, and that's what I found, like the last three or four months, looking back, it was like constant triage, constant emergency room. And it's, it's, it's draining. And there are very few times where it's critical to be in that state of mind. But for most of what um, we do, um, it's not necessary. And so um, it's... Um, it's important for me to break out of that just reactionary state and be a little bit more structured in, in how I work. And it's actually for me energetic um, to be able to like be more deliberate, block certain times, um, be um, focused on how much time I'm spending and, you know, kind of working in sprints. It's so much more energizing than just running from thing to thing to thing until like I literally can't do it anymore. It's like, all right, I'll start again tomorrow. It just doesn't work long term. So mm -hmm. that is that. So yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it and I'm hoping because last year I, I was pretty good for a while. And then what ends up happening, I think, with most of my um most of the things that I want to do on a daily basis, whether it's exercise or yoga or tracking my time, is I'll go really, really good and I can have really good long runs. And then one little thing will happen and it will get me off it. And I won't do it for a day or two. And it's so hard to reboot and start again. And so I'm trying to figure out how to avoid that trap. Because I know there'll be a day where like, I just don't track my time or I'm just not into it. And how do I avoid the trap of that being the excuse? I'm like, all right, that was enough. I'm done with that. Why, why do you think that is that like you could go so long and do it and then one little thing one day comes along and it kind of completely throws you off your rhythm? I, I don't know. But for me, it's like the power of... Um, and maybe this isn't a good thing, but it's the power of having um, a streak going. And I actually think I used to have an app called Streaks. I, I think there's okay. very much, a, for me, there's very much a power in looking at it and seeing that filled out every day. And it's the same with like hitting, you know, whatever step goals a day or riding the bike so many times that the power of that streak for me, it gets to a point where there's so much momentum that it compels me to do it on days I don't want to do. It's like, well, I'm 180 days in. I can't break the streak. But then it also has the opposite effect of if, like, I literally just don't get it done and I break the streak, I'm like, what does it matter anymore? Like, my streak is gone. Like, I had this great streak going. Rather than saying, okay, well, I'll start again. I'll start a new streak. Um, I haven't figured out how to get over that hurdle. Interesting. Yeah, and, I mean, it kind of ties into to our topic today. So we teased it a bit on the last episode and I want to continue the conversation around what the business world can learn from 
from sports. Mm. And we, we, we wrapped up the conversation. To, I, I was retelling a story of when I was a kid. And, you know, um, first year playing football, and I just didn't like it. And I wanted to quit. My parents said, no, you don't have to play next year. But you committed to everybody this year. You need to follow through on your commitment. Right. So I wanted to kind of continue on that th- that that thread there is around like commitment and integrity, um, or or lack thereof. What happens when there's a lack of integrity? But you kind of kicked this off with with an interesting conversation around streaks, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know you see that happen all the time in in sports. And you either see like this, this rookie come out of nowhere, maybe even like a second year player come out of nowhere and starts tearing it up. And then by their fourth year in the league, you know, they're, they're, they're nowhere to be found be there because they just hit a hot streak coming out. They just started out so hot or with that streak, maybe they, they only had one or two, one, one or two, uh, sets of skills and they were easily found out. So I, I started going down that path when you were talking about streaks and easily being thrown off streaks or the momentum you get behind us, you know, when, when you start, you know, day after day. Yeah. And I think another way to look at it. Uh, so over the break, I read uh, this book called the obstacle is the way, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. And um thinking about it both in a sports context and a business context, one of the challenges with streaks um, is that they all come to an end. We hit an obstacle. Um, You know, we can be in the zone, we can be feeling really good and it's kind of easy in that moment, but it's not going to be easy forever. There's always going to be some kind of obstacle we hit. And I think we've been led to believe that, that that is something to, um, avoid, um, be upset about, like we shouldn't hit obstacles and, um, it it gets us down. And I think that's, again, a lot of what in, in my streaks that I see, it's like, well, an obstacle is a failure. I hit something I shouldn't have hit. And so now I'm, I'm frustrated. I lack the motivation to start a new streak again. Um, but the reality is, is that if we look back on it, those obstacles are where we've had kind of our greatest learning opportunities that it's easy when things are easy and you just kind of go through the motion, but it's when we've hit an obstacle, that's where we get stronger, where we get smarter. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to focus on this year as well is, you know, when my streak is broken, when things are going well, and then something comes up rather than looking at it as something to be frustrated or angry about, embrace it and say, yes, you know, this is odd. This is an amazing opportunity to get start stronger, smarter, better. Um, and I'm hoping that will help me then restart the next streak or not even see it as a break in a streak at all that I just continue, continue on. So I, you know, I, I've never played, uh, I've never played athletics at any kind of an elite level, but I have to imagine that that plays into it as well, that even, people that aren't at the top of their game get in hot streaks, you know, that in, I don't know what the term in hockey is, but in basketball, it's like the, the, the basket seems like the size of the ocean. Like doesn't you just throw it up there and it's going to go in cause it looks so big, you know, people hit that, but I think it's the superstars, the people that are at the top of their game that are able to work through it when it doesn't, when it looks like the size of a dime that, that they're not, they don't allow that to detract them from what they're trying to do. And they continue to work through those obstacles um, to then once again, get on a, get on a hot street. Yeah. And, and funny enough in, in my Twitter feed today, um, some flyers highlights from the 2000 playoffs came up and this one defenseman, um, you I forget how many years he was in the league. I even think he may have been a rookie that year. Uh, Andy Delmore in the playoffs just went on a scoring tear. And they were showing highlights of this one had playoff hat trick he had scored. And it was the same thing. Like I remember at the time because it was, it was, it was an exciting year uh, to, to, to watch them. And it was, it was like, no matter what shot he took, the puck found its way to, to the net. And yeah, like it, you, you hear those kind of euphemisms across all sports, you know, where it's just like, you know, it, it, you're, you're a magnet. 
and the ball just comes to you or yeah, like the, the target, whether it's a basket or a goal or something like that, it's so big you can't miss. But yeah, you bring you bring up an interesting juxtaposition though, talking about those that put in the time to practice, those that are elite, they they know how to deal when when it's not going as as easy. The me, the mental fortitude to to deal with the 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 dry spell, the drought. Yeah, and I'm and I'm wondering how much you know. There's also in the news feed today in the past couple of weeks has been this continuing um, narrative of the great resignation with lots of folks quitting their jobs. And I think um, there there's a part of it that is people are reevaluating what's important in their lives and trying to find a job that better aligns with their purpose. And I'm, I'm completely on board with that. But part of me wonders if another part of it is what you've just talked about that, um, it's been good for so long, um, mm-hmm. especially people that may have entered the workforce maybe within what the last 12 years. I think maybe the last really challenging time was the subprime mortgage collapse in the oh, late 708. Yeah. Since then, we've been on a hot streak. We've been on a really good streak. Mm-hmm. And, and COVID kind of brought that streak to an end. And I'm wondering, you know, for those that maybe hadn't hit obstacles of that size, if that it's, less about reevaluating career and more of like this obstacle sucks. It's really hard. I broke my streak. Like everything was going great for 10, 12 years. And now my streak is broken. Eh, I'm, I, I'm not going to go on because I, in contrast, there's definitely been others that have kind of, again, the superstars, you don't even see that mentality. It's like, okay, it's an obstacle. Great. What, what can I learn from it? How can I get better? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've seen this with companies, right? Like we've seen this in our own client base. Um, very early on, we saw companies take the stance of, oh, our streak, our run is over. You know, we were going good for 12 years. Now this is really hard. We're just going to throw our hands up in the air. And in fact, we've had, we had companies we worked with said, we're going to put our head in the sand for a year, two years, whatever it takes. When we reemerge from this pandemic, then we'll get back to doing business. And we've had other clients that said, those guys are crazy. You know, like this is this obstacle is an incredible opportunity for us to get stronger than our competitors to really figure things out. And those are going to be the super. Those are the superstars already. Like that mentality is a winning mentality. Um, So, again, not not to say that from the great resignation, that's everybody that's happening. But I'm I'm coming to the belief that it's a it's a pretty good chunk of that segment of people that are kind of throwing their hands up and giving up. It's like this is too hard. I can't do it anymore. So do you see that as, you know, a lack of integrity, a lack of commitment? I don't think so. Okay. Because no, I mean, I go, yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say like where I wanted to go with the, the commitment thing, you know, kind of tying it back to, to the story I was telling earlier is, is, is not giving up the, the minute it gets hard. And I don't want that to, be confused with sticking through an environment that you know is bad. It's toxic. It's, it's not going to work that that's not it. It's the, you know, to your point, like the streak is over. This is the first bit of adversity. I'm just going to throw my hands up, quit and move on to the next thing. Yeah. So I, I I definitely don't think it as lack of integrity. I don't see it as lack of integrity at at all. Um, I, I don't see it as lack of commitment to the employer. If there's lack of commitment, it may be to the self um, that, you know, maybe there's a little bit of lack of commitment to bettering myself or investing in myself. Because, again, I think these opportunities are really where we become smarter and stronger at, at everything that we do. And so maybe backing out on that, maybe taking an easier route, maybe saying, you know what, I'm going to sub out of the game and sit this one out for a while. Um, you know, maybe that's a lack of commitment to bettering ourselves um but it's hard i get it like you know we we've all been there to that breaking point where it's like i just can't do it anymore but it's the elite of the elite that are able to push through that through it um i i can't remember who it was it was an mma athlete uh that was being interviewed um and the interview asked a question about why he was so good at, at what he did and he was saying you know is it is it your training is it your technical skill is it your you know striking skills is it your 
you know, your workout routine where you run up and down the a sandy beach and it's, you know, is it any of those things? He's like, no, no. It's like, well, all of those things actually, you know, add to it. But I think the differentiator is, is that I am able to find out where people's breaking points are. And if it's here, then my breaking point is here. And I'm just going to keep pushing up against their breaking point until they quit. Um, and I think, you know, that's the mentality that a lot of elite athletes, elite people in the business world take is that, um, I'm able to, I'm able to raise my breaking point to a level that's above everyone else's. It's not that I'm more technically gifted. It's not that I maybe, um, are stronger, but mentally my point, my breaking point is so much higher that I'm able to just outlast my opponents. And, and we see that in the business world again, all the time, whether it's from an employee perspective or a business perspective, a lot of the wins don't come from going out there and just punching someone right in the face. A lot of the wins is, is simply being willing to be more resilient than everyone else and go through incredibly difficult challenges and, and survive when other people give up. Mm -hmm. And to, to quote a fictional Philadelphia sports figure, um, God, and I know I'm now going to mess it up now that I'm <laughs> quoting it. it. You know, it's not how many times you get knocked down; it's how many times you get back up. Or actually, now what, now what, I need to pull up the exact quote. What is that, Rocky? Yep. Yeah, here we go. The great Philadelphia. Right. No, oh, no, it's Vince Lombardi. There, there's a similar Rocky quote. So, no, it's Vince Lombardi. It's, well, it's not whether you get knocked down. It's whether you get up. Um, here, Here's the Rocky quote. Um, okay. Life's not about how hard of a hit you can give. It's about how many you can take and still keep moving forward. Okay, so I got the two. You, you, com you combined them somehow. I did. Yeah, I combined <laughs> the two. Yes. So, yeah, I, I'll put the... the both quotes in in the show notes but yeah so to quote rocky life's not about how many hit uh how hard of a hit you can give it's about how many you can take and still keep moving forward. that's right hey, same, yeah. same same message right yeah um yeah and 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 again i uh, i i think that's more whatever that level is it's more about you than a commitment to anyone else it's more about a commitment to yourself than a commitment to an employer or to a team or or any mm -hmm. of that that isn't to say that there aren't real commitment issues you know we see that in the business world we see that in the sports world all the time but when it comes to doing really incredibly difficult things people hit a limit and quit a lot but that doesn't mean they lack integrity that doesn't mean they lack commitment to their employer it's just these things are really difficult and it's, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to be resilient and face the type of grueling punishment it takes to be great at anything you do. I mean, mm -hmm. to be great, it's a path filled with obstacles and that can be incredibly difficult. If it was what's, you know, every, it's like, if it, if it was easy, then everyone would do it, right? Like mm -hmm. if it was easy to be a superstar athlete, everyone would do it. If it'd be easy to grow an amazing business, then everyone would do it, but it's not, it's not easy at all. It's very difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like how you phrased it, you know, a commitment to to oneself because it, it's exactly that. I mean, there is a level of commitment that that you have to make and whether it's continuing to make yourself better or knowing when to kind of take the foot off the gas for a little bit to to rest and recoup. Because you know, I you know, we've talked about this in other episodes and we we touched on it in one aspect last week where we were talking about when you look at the elite athletes and you hear them talk, you know, they're able to slow the pace of the game down to, to what they need it to be, to be, you know, that, that comes as part of being an elite athlete. But if you watch some of them, they're really good at conserving energy. They're not running up and down the court at, at full speed constantly. They're not skating at no. no. Oh, keep going. Oh, okay, they're not skating up and down the ring at full speed constantly. Mm -hmm. They 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 know how to conserve energy and still be a part of the play, but not be redlining the entire time. And That's they right. know exactly when to turn it on. So that could be also part of commitment too, is knowing when 
to rest because if we bring in the whole hustle culture thing mm -hmm. that we've been seeing the last couple of years, you know, if you're not sprinting at a hundred percent, 22 hours a day, you're not working hard enough. You're not going to be successful. Right. But again, how many, how sustainable is that? Yeah, right? And that's my point is yeah. that's not sustainable. Yeah. And, and again, I think, um, take drawing the um comparison to to athletics it's it's the same thing i mean just look at any of the top level athletes that you may follow they're not going all out all the time it's it's they're conserving energy and then they're sprinting as hard as they possibly can in a moment and then and then pulling it back and mm -hmm. and it's the same for for the business world and you know we i think we were off camera when when we were talking about this but it's one of the things that I was seeing in myself the last couple months of, of last year is I was in this triage emergency. Everything had to be a sprint state and it was draining and exhausting and I wasn't doing my best work. I wasn't at the top of my game. And the reality is, is that those that are at the top of their game operating at an elite level, whether it's sports or business are not sprinting all the time. It's humanly impossible. Mm -hmm. And so from a business perspective, the mentality that we should be in constant sprints it, and, and, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure some software engineers are going to like, uh, have a problem with me having a problem with like the, the thing that's in vogue right now, which is this whole concept of sprint planning where everything is a sprint, but the, the, the mentality of that I think is so defeating because you, it's impossible to constantly be sprinting. Even the greatest sprinters in the world only sprint for less than a half of 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 a percent of the time they're actually working, right? We, we, we just can't be in that mode all the time for any foreseeable amount of time without simply running out of energy. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's an important thing for us to, to recognize that it's, it's not feasible. And if, if we're in that mentality from a business perspective, we may feel like we're productive, we may feel like we're hustling and we're doing it all. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we we reach a point of diminishing returns very, very quickly. And we are absolutely not at the top of our game. We are mm -hmm. absolutely not doing our best work. That That is for sure. And one of the best in hockey that I've seen in recent decades with that in his prime was Peter Forsberg. Before his foot really became a problem, yeah, and he just he could not whatever the chronic issue was with his foot. If you watched him, when there was a window of opportunity, he was skating as hard as he could be, and he was as focused as he can be. But then, but before that, he was focused on watching the play develop. He would glide with intention, like yeah, like he would move with this intention, but not this frantic, frantic. You know, I don't want to overuse the word sprint, but this frantic pace of rushing from one point to another, he'd watch the play develop, wait for that window of opportunity to open. And the minute it did, bam, he was there. Yeah, no, you're I, and that's a great example of it. And and again, it's I, if I think about it in terms of soccer, it's probably messy. Um, if I think about it in terms of basketball, maybe Kobe. Um, just kind of floating and gliding. Yeah. And then there's this moment of pure explosive energy, um, unlike ever seen by, by most other athletes. And then it's back to this floating and gliding. And then there's a moment of explosive energy. And I think if you look at the grades, you'll see that pattern repeated again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Because they weren't constantly attacking. They were observing the play. And they were waiting for the perfect opportunity to open up. That's right. Yeah. And, and again, I think if we think about it in terms of business, it's such a powerful metaphor to, to use, whether it's doing really incredibly difficult work, whether it's being kind of floating, observing, and then in a meeting, standing up and delivering a really strong message that's where you're going to have the impact, right? Like the person, the colleague that's always yelling and shouting and wants to be out in front and going, there, there's no impact. But if in the business world, if I'm floating, if I'm gliding, if I'm observing, if I'm calculating and analyzing, and then I see that moment to explode and strike and I deliver something, that's going to have meaning, right? It's mm -hmm. like, 
you know, if Jim speaks, he doesn't speak a lot, but when he does, there's massive weight there. And, and I think there's, again, a huge lesson we can learn from that. Mm -hmm. Um, just as a side. So, um, Evan asked me to, um, do an evaluation of two relationships over the break. And one of them I chose was you. And one of the questions he asked is, you know, what would you guys enjoy doing together? I said, I think Jim and I would enjoy going to a sporting event and drawing parallels to the business world. So it's mm -hmm. kind of fun that we're, we're, we're having this conversation today. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, I think so. Um, because the other thing I was thinking of in that, that, that vein of, constantly attacking you know the, the the frantic play is is the is, is sitting at your computer because think about it at just about everybody's job these days they're in in front of a computer well in the business world let's yeah. focus there yeah everybody is in front of a computer so sitting in front of a computer hacking on a keyboard all day is another metaphor to that that constantly being on the playing field moving at a frantic pace and just rushing all over the place. I think some of my best ideas, if I look back at the last two years, some of my best ideas have come when I wasn't in front of the computer. I think most for most of us don't come when we're not in front of the computer. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, and, and I'm glad you, you brought it up because it's something that we've been trying to embody I think you even have like a walkabout scheduled on your calendar as a reoccurring mm -hmm. meeting to um, get away from the computer. And, um, it, it, that, that time. Of, so the time on the computer is putting to work to create the output, but it's everything else that prepares us for that moment. So if we go back to the sports analogy, right? So the, the, the thinking, the spending time outdoors, the walkabouts, the, you know, for me, it's walking over and playing the piano for a few minutes or getting away and picking up a book. All of that is the gliding, the observing, the thinking. And then when we come sit at the computer, we have a burst of creativity of output where we combine that all together in one moment and then it's gone again. We, eat, But it's so counterintuitive to what we've been graded by for most of our careers, at least for most of us, you know, I, I've been very open about sharing stories of working for companies where we would have bosses that would literally go around and take role. Are you in your seat at this time between this time and that time, you know, reinforcing the message that when we're at our computer typing at our computer, that's, that's the expected state for eight hours a day. Um, but to your point, and if we're being honest with ourselves, most of our breakthroughs, most of our really insightful um, strategies and things that we've come up with to solve incredibly difficult problems rarely come when we're sitting down and typing at the keyboard. It's when we're in the shower. It's when we're out going for a walk. When it's, you know, it's anywhere else other than. But mm -hmm. we don't allow ourselves that time. And if we do, we say, well, that's not work. And that's nonsense. That is work. That's actually the most important part of work. Yeah. But we've been led to believe otherwise. And then and then we wonder why the companies we work for are so, are so boring and mediocre and why we're not coming up with any great insights. Well, it's because we've been we've been um, conditioned to sit at our desk typing all day. Of course, mm -hmm. it's going to be boring. Yeah. So I want to pivot the conversation a bit now, and I do want to touch on, on integrity. So okay. we, we, we kind of briefly touched on it, like, and we were talking about like commitment, but as I was thinking through the ideas of commitment and, and integrity or, or lack thereof, I think there's definitely some, some, some great parallels. So things that the business world can learn from sports is, at, you know, sports like you could be the best athlete, but the minute you're shown to have no integrity, mm -hmm. whether, you know, the biggest thing is, is cheating, finding ways to cheat. Like you are dead to people. Yeah. Um, let, let's think of, you know, major league baseball and the performance enhancing drug scandal. Um, you know, if you remember, God, I think it was late nineties. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> the Bonds, McGuire, mm -hmm. Sosa home run race. Mm -hmm. And then you come to find out that it was you know, all like, a lie. It was, it all, was a all a lie. Yeah. It, you know, like, I mean, 
they, they all, you know, in some form or another, allegedly, I'm, I'm going to use the word allegedly, um, just so, you know, just to cover our asses, um, you know, used some form of performance enhancing drugs, you know, these, mm -hmm. and like, I know for, for my dad, like he, he used to love baseball, played baseball growing up. And then you had the strike in 94 mm -hmm. and it just, he didn't want anything to do with baseball after that. Like to him, that was like, no, like, like that, 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 that kind of broke his trust, mm -hmm. you know, that, that as a paying customer, as a paying fan, like that really sat with him badly. And then when the home run race erupted a couple years later, it got him back into it. And then as word started to leak out that it wasn't on the up and up, like it was, it was the same kind of thing. It's like, you assholes got me again. <laughs> right? I think like he held a grudge about yeah. it because to him, there was a lack of integrity there. And then even look recently with the Houston Astros. Yeah. Um, you know, with the cheating to, to win the world series. I mean, they were pariahs. Yeah. Like fans went to games specifically to boo them. Yeah. Um, following, there was a whole Twitter account following that. And even other players took it out on them. Yeah. That, it was, you know, that, that came out leading up to the 2020 season, which became a shortened season. And, you know, with COVID, like this became secondary. But I remember the spring training leading up to before everything was paused before COVID, like, the main players that were part of that cheating ring and stealing the signals, every time they would come up to bat, they would just stand there because they knew they were going to get hit. You know, pitchers were throwing at them intentionally. Yeah. You know, because they were like, yo, you, you cheated. You, there's a, a black eye on our sport. And we feel like some of us lost unfairly because you, you cheated. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot, lot to digest there, but like that, that's one of the things with, with sports when cheaters are found out, when liars are found out, like they most times, I'm not going to say all the time, but <coughs> most times like they're, they're ostracized by either their, their own, by other athletes or, or the fans themselves. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, and I don't know if there's a direct parallel. Well, I don't know if there's a direct parallel to the business world because unfortunately we don't see that. We don't see the integrity held up as much. It's all, it's like athletes often have more respect for the integrity of their game than business. That's um, true. You know, and as we started out again, I think we weren't, we didn't have the, the, uh, the camera going when we were talking about it, but I, I think a lot of people accept that business is, is, is a dirty game and it's not about integrity. It's not about morals and that those that win realize that and are able to play the game, this dirty game to, to succeed. So from a parallel standpoint, I almost think it's, it's the opposite that the sports figures often have way more respect for the game they're playing than, than the business world. Um, they respect the integrity of the sport to your point, And we see it whether it's the Houston Astros cheating and other players and teams um, feeling and rightly so that the integrity of the game was attacked and they take that out on them. Uh, we see it in other sports um, where, you know, faking injuries and diving. Uh, I, there's a great soccer clip and I know soccer gets a lot of uh, crap about diving and dra dramatic, dramatically faking injuries uh, but there's a great clip of a player taking a dive and his own teammates being upset at him for ruining the integrity of the sport and just letting him have it right during the game. Um, you know, we, we often don't see that in the business world. And I think that's something that we can learn from from athletics, from sports that we should adopt, that we should have a lot more respect for what we do. And and this flopping, diving, cheating, being just bad people that in the business world, we've talked about this before on podcasts, it's just business. We need to change that. That's it's nonsense that we keep we keep this narrative going that it's okay for us to not respect the institutions of what we're doing because it's business. So we can be, you know, less than the ideal human. We can do things that are hurtful to others. We can be um, we can lack character or morals, but it's okay because it's just business. 
It's like, no, like, let's yeah. take a, let's take a page from the book of athletics that like they're standing up for something. This is important. And there's a respect for the game. It's there's like a respect for the craft, a respect for the craft. And we, and you know, we seem to be missing that in the business world. With that said, I would say on an individual level, having, um, having morals and standing up and respecting what you do, um, I think can have some massive wins and having integrity because it is not expected in the business world can be a huge competitive advantage. And I have two stories. So one early in my career, and this was with Carrie that we worked with forever at HBR. I worked with her at Staples and she probably doesn't even remember this story, but um, I was running uh, an AB test for Staples um, and I messed something up and it put these large black boxes over several places on the homepage that you would just see a big black box. Um, and it was like that for about two hours before I caught it and took it down. And for a brief moment, I thought, well, you know, like the, the business world says like, hide this and like deflect blame and someone else did it. And oh, this was Adobe's problem. Cause there's a problem with, you know, target or whatever. And I'm like, no, you know, I, I want to have, and I believe I have more integrity than that. So I analyzed what went wrong. I wrote up a, finding and I called up Carrie. I said, Carrie, I messed up. You know, here's what I did. Here's was the, here's the impact. And here's what we're going to do to make sure that never happens again. And, and it wasn't because of that specific moment, but that moment bought so much trust with Carrie that we went on to have an amazing relationship at Staples, which continued over to Harvard business review, where we worked with Carrie until she retired, literally until the day she retired. And we still have a a great connection with her for, for many, many years. And I think a big part of that was this integrity that we embodied that is so missing from the business world. And when people see that, they're like, I want that, you know, that is so rare. Um, recently we, we published and, and launched a is for analytics, our children's book. And with the first 200 ish copies that came off the production line, there were some inconsistencies in the binding. And um, I think I'm actually going to pull up one of the reviews on Amazon. Um, But we decided that um, we were going to replace all 200 copies that went out in that first batch, whether the books were bad or not, because we didn't know. We knew some of them were bad. We knew some of them were good, but we didn't know which ones. So rather than waiting for the customer to get mad and say, Hey, we have a shitty book here. It's falling apart. We said, you know what? We're going to replace everyone's book at no cost. And we're going to overnight you a new book. And I, I can't tell you, I've lost track of how many messages we've received back from people that are blown away. They're like, what? Like, this is completely unexpected. Let me pull up one of the Amazon reviews here. I'll just read it. I'm not doing saying this to like kind of toot our own horn, but just to give some real world um, examples of, of why this, this works. So, um, so I'll just read the the review word for word. Um, This is from, from Scott. Um, I was one of the first 200 people to order the book shortly after my copy shipped. The author discovered that the printing company had made a binding error on about 10% of the books. He immediately reached out and apologized for the error even before I had received my copy. He then shipped a replacement copy to everyone who ordered the book in the first printing run, even if their copy did not have a flaw. Your kids will learn analytics terminology from this book, but businesses everywhere could learn customer service from 33 sticks. Um, You know, we didn't have to do that. You know, we could have said, ah, there's errors in printing. People would know that, you know, it's not perfect, but the integrity and respect for the craft of what we do was more important than that. And, you know, so we took a loss in replacing everyone's book, but the gain we got in showing some integrity, I think is, is priceless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, integrity is something, and this is going to sound so cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. And that's another cliche. (laughs) Um, But integrity is something that takes a long time to build up yeah but can be burned down so quickly Um, you have to commit to it every day you can ruin that in one instance you know whether it's trying to cover something up and believe me falling on your sword is hard it is Uh, you know admitting a mistake is is hard but 
the integrity and yes, like this is absolutely something the business world can learn from sports is that, you know, um, you know, having protecting the integrity of the craft, um, having integrity as, as an individual, um, and, and being accountable for, for what you do. Cause yeah, we're taught, you know, get in, make yours and get out. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what you burn down or who you chop down along the way. Yeah. You know, as long as you got yours, you're good. Um, and I mean, I can't tell you that there have been times where I was either, you know, moving on to a new role or, or leaving the company altogether and like the panic setting in, making sure that everything was, was in order before, before I wrapped up. Yeah. And I, and speaking of wrap up, I think that's a great place to wrap this up is you're, you're absolutely right. And <laughs> I, I think whether you're a business, um, so you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, you're ex an executive leadership function, or you're an individual um, working in the business world, because this is so commonplace, again, lack of respect for the craft, that having integrity and respect for what you do uh, is one of the easiest ways, well, seemingly easiest ways, <laughs> um, simplest paths to standing out from the crowd because people don't expect it. And it's sad, you know, people don't expect businesses to operate with integrity. People don't expect sales guys to, you know, give us the truth. They ex we expect to be lied to, you know, people expect their colleagues to stab them in the back because it's just part of them getting theirs, as you said. Mm -hmm. So when you're the opposite of that and you operate with integrity, it is so easy to stand out from the crowd, whether you're an employee or a business, because people don't expect it to happen. And when they see it, it is so refreshing and they want more of that because it is so incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So we'll go ahead and wrap up there. Um, and yeah, I think that this was a great conversation. Um, you know, I think we're off to, to a great start for the year and, uh, great. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you much, and we'll talk to everybody later. See ya. See ya.